Well, let's consider the first few terms of this summation. When n is equal to 1, then m is going to iterate from 0 to 0, and we only get one term. So we get cex times dhy dx, and the first value. And then when n is equal to 2, then m iterates from 0 to 1, and then we have two terms. We'll have c times dhy dx, the second value of that, and then c times, and we're going to have an exponential here, e to the minus sigma e cx, our sigma value in the PML, times 1 delta t, and all that times dhy dx1. This is equal to, th this one right here, this is equal to the result that we got at n minus 1. So notice right here, we have the result at n minus 1, and so now we're just multiplying it by this exponential. The one that, the result that we got earlier, one time step earlier, we're taking that result, multiplying it by this exponential, and we're tacking on another term. We could keep going, but it turns out that at each time step, we're going to multiply the previous result one time step earlier by the exponential, and we're going to add on the latest c times dhy dx term. This is called a recursive convolution technique. The fact that we can use the result that was previously calculated and just keep multiplying and adding on to it so that we don't have to store the value over all the previous time steps we can just iteratively keep adding and multiplying onto that value. This is the expression that we had on the previous slide. For convenience, we'll say at time step n, this is equal to psi, and with the same subscript and superscript, and at time step n. And using the recursive convolution technique, as discussed on the previous slide, psi at time step n is equal to So this at time step n is conveniently equal to b coefficient times the psi at the previous time step. So here we're multiplying it times the coefficient, the previous value times the coefficient, and we're adding on an extra term corresponding to the latest time step. So here, the b coefficient is equal to the exponential sigma ezx pml epsilon naught delta t, and c, as we previously defined it, is the same exponential minus 1. If we take a step back and consider what this equation means in words, that is this one right here, and taking into account the coefficients, it says the following. Each time step, we multiply dhy dx by c. It turns out that c is a damping term. So what we're doing is we're damping the value of dh y dx, and this attenuates the wave. And then we further damp older values by of psi by multiplying those again by b e x with each new time step. Putting all this together, we attenuate the electric field component oriented perpendicular to the prop direction of propagation in the PML, and we attenuate that component in the PML. Going back to Ampere's law, which is written here, 
We can now write this in discrete form using central differencing by plugging in psi for the convolution. So on the left side, we're going to get the usual central differencing. So n plus 0.5, i plus 0.5, k plus 0.5 minus, this is a x derivative, so same time step, i minus 0.5, and k, same k, k plus 0.5, over delta x, and then plus psi for this, this term, this will be our psi term. So we have psi e zx pml, and that's at location i k plus 0.5, time step n, and that's equal to epsilon, and we have the time, partial time derivative, so using central differencing, e z i k plus 0.5 n plus 1 minus 1 time step earlier divided by delta t. So you can see that this psi is at the same time step and same location as the e z field that we're going to be using this to update. So now we can solve for the future field component. And this is what we end up with for solving for the future value of EZ within the PML. So here's our future value of EZ equation again. And here I've written out what psi is equal to. Notice that the B and the C coefficients each have an index i. This is because they depend on the PML conductivity, which will change with depth into the PML. So here's sigma, here's our PEC, here's the PML, and here's our wave propagation towards the PML. And so it's changing with depth into the PML just as it did for our one-dimensional FDT decode. What's nice about this approach is that if we need to model a lossy material like the ionosphere, these PML updates we've derived for free space do not change even when we have a lossy material. That is, while we developed this PML, we assumed that there is only free space in the grid. But if we go back to Ampere's law and we include the current density term that accounts for material losses, J lossy material, is equal to sigma e, if we include that, we would get the same expression as what's shown here, but we would use the more general ca and cb coefficients. Here's the update equation for ez that we get with the more general ca and cb coefficients. The first part of this equation is the same as what we've seen before, all the way up to here. So now, what's new is that we're just adding on a new term at the end. Note that the CB coefficient includes a delta term in the denominator right here, which we don't want in the coefficient for psi. So multiplying here by delta or delta x, as delta as we're calling it in our model, it's only there to cancel, because we're multiplying times CB, it's only there to cancel this delta in the denominator just when we're multiplying it times psi. This is the final version of the update equation that we will implement in the PML region of our model for the EZ components. If we went through the same process but starting with Faraday's law instead of Ampere's law, we would derive an analogous equation for the HY update. Again, this is the same type of update equation as what we already had in the two-dimensional grid, except now there is an extra term at the end. And since mu does not change in our grid, and because we will not be introducing any magnetic loss, you can keep the same coefficients for the HY update as for free space. You don't even have to make them into arrays or matrices. You can just say DA is equal to 1, and DB will be equal to delta T over mu delta X across the entire grid, even in the PML region. This type of PML that we developed is called a uniaxial PML. It came about after uh, the split field PML. The word uniaxial comes from the fact that it doesn't require field splitting. And more 
A more advanced formulation of UPML can be developed that can absorb evanescent waves more easily and that can also absorb lower frequencies better. But this UPML is good enough for our purposes. Next time we will look into how to implement this PML on the right side of our two-dimensional FDTD model.